When I was 11 years old, I had two best friends and they were complete and total opposites. Deborah was outspoken and bold, the fourth child of two wealthy, sports-obsessed doctors. Chantel was thoughtful and cautious, the only daughter of a waitress who never seemed to catch a break. It may be that the only thing that we have in common is a terrifying experience that linked us together for life. It started as these things often do, with an unexpected last-minute change of plans. Normally, the three of us had a sleepover at least once a month. We always tried to go to Deborah's. I mean, what kid wouldn't? There were hills for sledding in winter, a rec room in the basement for rainy spring days, a fireplace to tell scary stories around in the fall, and in summer, a sparkling pool out back. To us, it was paradise. We tried my place a few times, but the disappointment that I saw or imagined on my friends' faces as I showed them around the shabby little apartment and made a nod to my stomach, and I was relieved whenever they laughed. We had never even been to Chantel's until that fateful Saturday in June. My parents were out of town and the original plan was that we would stay at Deborah's all weekend until Deborah's mom came down with a nasty flu and banned guests from her home. Under the circumstances, Chantel's mother reluctantly allowed us over. When we stepped out from the bus, I thought that we had made a mistake. There was only a highway and pine trees. Chantel took a deep breath as though preparing for something and led us down a narrow concrete drive almost hidden by the forest. Deborah and I exchanged a glance, but there was nothing to do but follow our friend down the dark lane. Under the shadowy branches, the air was cooler. It smelled like sap and wet dirt. And the dilapidated trailer at the end of the drive was so hemmed in by trees that the branches scraped the windows and junk rotted in heaps in the tall grass. But there were cheerful Christmas lights strung around the sagging porch, and Chantel's mom smiled and waved as we approached. She talked our ears off as soon as we had stepped inside, and before long we were chowing down on tomato soup and toasted cheese that she had clearly made especially for our visit. Before long she gave Chantel a kiss on the cheek, told us to watch out for rusty nails outside, and headed to her third shift job at the hospital. She turned suddenly at the door. Chantel, remind them not to let anyone in, no matter how hard they knock or how scary they sound, or who they say they are. If they're meant to be in here, they'll have a key. As the door closed, I noticed that the peephole in the door was plugged shut and curtains covered every window. It seemed very odd to me, but I mean everyone had some quirks, right? And before long, we were having more fun than we had ever had at Deborah's, running through the misty trees and catching lightning bugs. Twilight came early in the woods. Back inside, we were sprawled out on the shag carpet surrounded by a pillow for it and unhealthy snacks, laughing as we flipped through weird old magazines. Deborah's parents were so overprotective and in my neighborhood, it wasn't safe to leave a kid at home alone. So this was the first time that we had spent a night without adult supervision. The feeling that we could literally do anything without a chance of getting caught was so exhilarating that I barely noticed Chantel methodically checking the doors and blinds to make sure that everything was completely shut. The first knock could have been anything. We were laughing so hard that we barely heard it. Chantel told us to hush and stood up suddenly. What crawled up your butt and died? Deborah asked, which only made us laugh harder. Her face is serious as stone. Chantel clasped a hand over Deborah's mouth, ignoring her muffled protests. 
That snapped me out of it. I realized that the drone of insects from the forest had stopped completely. Something was wrong. It was quiet enough that there was no mistaking the next pattern. Tap, tap, tap on the front door. Seriously, Chantel, what's wrong with you? Deborah giggled, twisting free of her weaker friend. We shushed at her furiously. Knock, knock, knock. The sound was more insistent now, like an angry neighbor wanting to make a noise complaint. Let's go to my room. Chantel suddenly announced in a whisper. Please? And Deborah and I exchanged another glance and then shrugged. Chantel turned off the lights in the television. Something like instinct compelled us to move quietly. And our attempts to tiptoe made the ramshackle trailer seem especially empty and silent. I felt cold sweat trickle down my spine each time the floor creaked. For some reason, my eyes kept darting to the curtain windows, and I would swear that I heard a faint tapping at each window as we passed it, as if there was a little boy outside throwing pebbles. Chantal let out a sigh of relief as we entered her bedroom and shut the door, apparently glad to have another barrier between us and whatever was outside. We didn't say much as Chantal got out an old board game, Candyland I think, and began to set it up. Before long, Desper and Chantel started to whisper, giggle, and then finally talk normally again. But I couldn't calm down. It was too strange. I thought about the TV show, Cops, and psycho ex-boyfriends who came back to attack the family. And then I mentally replayed every horror movie that I had ever seen about crazy people who live deep in the woods. Chantel, at least, seemed to think the danger had passed. She was tossing the dice at Deborah's head. I wanted to ask her if the knocking was a regular occurrence, but I was too scared. Scared that talking about it might somehow make it real. About 40 minutes later, we heard pounding in the door. This time, we all made a point to ignore it and go on with our game. It worked until the doorbell had started ringing. The classic ding-dong didn't seem that menacing but Chantal had gone pale. I remembered then that the trailer didn't have anything so fancy as a doorbell out front, but it was getting louder now too, echoing down at the empty hallways. Chantal, I whispered, what's going on? I don't know, my friend finally responded. As long as I can remember wherever we've lived, there's been this knocking sometimes. Mom doesn't like to talk about it, but she says as long as I don't react, it'll go away eventually, and it always does. It can get really bad though. One time it went on for hours. I swear that I could actually see the dust and spiders getting knocked out of the walls. She gave us a nervous little smile. Sometimes a voice asks for you or calls for help. Sometimes it seems to be someone that you know. The doorbell, though, that one's new. Well, you can't let it walk all over you for the rest of your life. Deborah stopped chewing her bubblegum and gave us a serious glare. The tapping continued in the background, almost like a drumbeat. Deborah, Chantel warned. But our headstrong friend already grabbed a taped-up hockey stick from Chantel's closet and flung open the bedroom door. Hey, Deborah bellowed, whatever it is, we aren't interested. The tapping stopped. The silence deepened. Deborah smirked. See, I keep telling you, you've just got to stand up for you. Chantel wasn't exaggerating when she said the blows were hard enough to shake the walls. The wall up that the house took was so hard it created clouds of dust. I screamed. Chantel hid under the bed, and Deborah used the hockey stick to smash a centipede as it fled across the room. The blows came one after another, as if a huge invisible hand was slapping the house. 
I joined Chantel under the bed, grabbing tight to the carpet with my eyes shut tight. I try not to feel the tiny legs of spiders scurrying over me. Every living thing was trying to escape the house. Debra, Chantel hissed, shut the door and get down here. I'm going to call your mom, Debra shouted from the hallway, or the police or somebody. It won't do any good, Chantel murmured. The knocking came from everywhere now. The windows, the back door, even from the trap door to the attic. It's never been this bad. She shouldn't have said anything. I tried to call, but all I heard on the phone line was a doorbell that wouldn't stop ringing. Deborah said in a small voice as she slid under the bed with us. The lights flickered. I don't think they're going to go away this time. Chantel snapped. Not until they get what they came for her. You guys are my best friends in the world, you know that. Don't come out, no matter what. But before we could stop her, Chantel darted from the bed and out the bedroom door, which she locked behind her with an old-fashioned key. Deborah charged and pounded on the door, demanding to know where she thought she was going. But it was obvious to me even before I heard the front door creak open. The knocking stopped immediately. Deborah and I tried to quiet our breathing, waiting. Hey, it's okay guys, you can come out now. Chantel called out after what felt like hours. We looked at each other and stayed put. Seriously. There were a few gentle taps on the bedroom door. Open up guys, it's fine. Why don't you use the key? Deborah muttered. There was a pause. I don't want to be alone out here, please. There was a noise like a child's hand patting the door, searching for a weak spot. Please, let me in. The patting soon became pounding. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. I don't know how long it went on for or how Deborah and I managed to fall asleep in each other's arms under the bed. Where Chantel's mom had found us the next morning. She called the police immediately, of course, but there was no sign of Chantel or even of any damage to the house. The sobbing, incoherent story that we told was a little help to the officers, and at one point we were accused of making it all up. Perhaps foolishly, Chantel's mother told the police about the strange knocking and supported our story. We never found out exactly how much she knew, because with no other suspect, she became the target of the investigation. The smiling, talkative woman who made us soup and sandwiches was found guilty for her daughter's murder. The house and land were sold and turned into warehouses. The missing person flyers faded and disappeared, and little by little, the world forgot about Chantel. Deborah and I, however, couldn't forget, even if we wanted to. Whatever had taken Chantel had heard Deborah's voice, and it wasn't going to let us go so easily. After my friend Chantel had disappeared when she answered a knock at her door, I made a list of rules for myself. I always kept my blinds shut, and I never answered any door or reacted to knocking, sounds, or voices if I couldn't see their source. I threw myself into my schoolwork and tried to put the whole thing behind me. My parents were so thrilled by my sudden interest in academics that they barely had noticed my new bizarre behavior around doors and windows. They just thought that I was growing up. The truth was that I had made a simple choice. I was going to make it no matter what. Out of that moldy apartment and wither in town. Away from these smoke belching factories and the housewives who gossiped about us besides stacks of angel food cake. I would go far away, far from anything unnatural, far from the past. And Deborah was a different story. While I looked to the future, she threw herself wholeheartedly into attempting to resolve the past. 
With her good looks, athletic skills, and influential family, Deborah was one of the most popular kids in school. Until their new obsession revealed how fickle people can be. Deborah went down a rabbit hole of paranormal investigation and occult studies. As her grades and health suffered, her friends had disappeared. The final straw came when she showed some guests a device that she had set up between the hall door and her bedroom door that would allow her to trap something in that area without looking at it. I have to admit, I was just as guilty of abandoning Deborah. The truth was is that I had blamed her too, and it wasn't easy to spend time with her when her only topic of conversation was something that I spent all my time trying to avoid. The atmosphere in her house didn't help. Deborah's parents' marriage didn't survive her traumatic shift in personality, and her mother's drinking habit became so severe that Deborah's father had gained custody of all of her siblings when he left. Although Deborah's psychiatrist convinced the judge to allow her to stay with her mother, that house, once an inviting place full of sights, smells, and sounds of a family living life to the fullest, it soon felt abandoned. On the nights when Deborah's mother would drunkenly wander the halls, humming songs to herself, it even felt haunted. By the time that we were teenagers, Deborah and I barely even saw each other, since neither of us responded to visits or even phone calls. We had to have had a different way of making contact. We met once a year on the day of Chantel's disappearance, in the parking lot of one of the warehouses where Chantel's home once stood. It was a good location, outdoors with plenty of warehouse workers around, and nowhere for anything to hide. We would each bring a thermos of our favorite drink and circle the parking lot talking about our lives. Or rather, I would try to talk about our lives, and Deborah would try to bring our conversation back to her obsession. The knocking, as we called it, happened to each of us a few times each year. Just as Chantel had warned us, it was sometimes longer or shorter, more intense or less, and seemingly random. The worst times were when we weren't alone and had to somehow prevent other people who were oblivious to the danger from doing something so obvious as opening a door. It happened to me when my family had ordered pizza. It was a big deal for us to celebrate the scholarship that I'd earned. When the three sharp raps hit the door and my father stood to answer, I practically dove down the hallway sliding on my socks. I stammered that the delivery boy was cute and I wanted some time to talk to him alone as I grabbed a handful of wrinkled dollars and closed the hallway door behind me. Behind me was the tiny worn-out living room that I'd always known. Beyond the door, who knew? Eyes closed, I leaned my head against the cold surface of the door to listen. I heard gibbering a ragged brass on the other side. The worst part was that my closeness to the door made the breathing heavier and faster, like something was getting excited or hungry. The three taps came again and I heard movement from the living room. With panic, I realized my parents were coming to see what was going on. I slid away from the front door and I closed off the hallway. Turns out he's a real idiot, I whispered. He'll probably just keep knocking to get my attention. Let's just ignore him, all right? My father made a get-the-shotgun sort of movement, but I grabbed his arm. He goes to my school, Dad, okay? Come on, don't make a scene. We sat awkwardly in the living room around the TV while the tapping droned on. When it stopped, we all let out a breath of relief, until it resumed again with a different beat. All right, that's it. My father bellowed, pushing himself out of his rocking chair and lurching towards the front door. Dad, no, I shouted, but it was too late to intercept him. My father flung open the apartment door, terrifying the middle-aged pizza delivery woman waiting with her order. 
Confused and embarrassed, my father handed over the cash that I had dropped and mumbled an apology as he accepted our pizza. When the woman left, he gave me a long, hard look. I hope you know what you're doing. My father sighed. Something was different about Deborah when we met that June, the year that I turned 18. I was going away to college the next fall. I wasn't sure what Deborah was doing after school. Each time that I saw her, she looked a little more gaunt, a little more weary, a little more faded. The sleeves of her hoodie were pulled down to her chipped, black pitted fingernails and she kept touching her hair. The pink dye had almost faded and each strand was cobweb then. What made me nervous though was the white SUV with glittering rims and blacked out windows that had dropped her off and was still waiting for her, bass humming like a huge mechanical shark. When I asked Deborah what she had been up to, her answers were scattered and vague. She couldn't give a clear account of where she had been or what she had been doing. And the conversation died quickly and with a nervous glance at the rumbling SUV, she turned to go. I reached out to stop her, suddenly sure that if she got in, I would never see her again. But she slipped through my grasp. As she did, she shoved something into my chest hard enough to make me stumble and muttered, This is for you. Whatever it was, it was heavy and square, wrapped in layer after layer of protected plastic bags. I sat in my car, sadly watching the white SUV pull away as I opened Deborah's package. Inside were letters. She had been writing to Chantel's mother in prison almost weekly, and these were the responses. Tears welling up my eyes, I jammed my car into gear. Deborah was in trouble. I had to find that white SUV. I thought that I saw it turn left and that would make sense. It was the highway back toward town. But I grew more and more panicked as the SUV failed to appear. I merged out of the highway and stepped on the pedal until my second hand Honda literally shook. When the speedometer passed 95, I finally saw it, idling along in the right lane like the driver wasn't in any hurry. I lined up a few cars behind and followed. The white SUV took a lazy path to a rundown side of town, an area that boomed back when railroad was king. Now old corrals and paper mills rusted beside weed covered tracks. It was a place where you ended up, not where you went on purpose. The SUV came to a stop behind a corrugated metal wall, and I stopped just before going around the corner. All I could do was hope that whoever was driving Deborah around hadn't heard my squealing brakes. A tanned, muscular man in a snow white suit and tie got out of the SUV and opened the rear door for Deborah and two other men wearing basketball jerseys and wraparound sunglasses. Next to these three, Deborah looked like a strong wind could blow her away. The odd group headed off in a triangle formation with Deborah in the middle. I was still trying to tell myself to go home, that this was none of my business, when one man lifted up his jersey to scratch his sweating back, and I saw a nickel-plated pistol stuffed into the top of his pants. I had no choice now, unable to decide whether to try to be stealthy or act natural. I half walked, half crept through the tick infested weeds along the dilapidated metal wall. Inside I could hear the whir of fans struggling against the humidity and the static buzz of AV equipment being checked. A heavy door slammed and I peered around the corner. As far as I could tell, my route to the door was completely clear. There was no one to catch me or to call for help. I rushed up to the door, shoved it open. I knew better than to knock and I burst into the building. Seven faces spun to gawk at me, all of them surprised. Deborah most of all. Two men had clearly reached for the weapons, but it was the man in the snow white suit who spoke. Who are you? He asked bluntly. I took a look around. Little drywall structures, bathrooms, offices, storerooms, lie me inside of the otherwise derelict structure. 
The partners to me had a stage lighting and a microphone boom as well, like some sort of film set. The fake bedroom, plastic wrapped mattress, handcuff lined bed frame, and Deborah's wardrobe indicated the nature of the film. Deborah had taken off her outer clothing and for the first time I saw how thin she was. She wasn't fast enough to cover the bruises and the track marks on her arms and legs. I'm, uh, I stammered. I'm the other girl for the shoot. The man in the white suit studied me skeptically. He had a cherry lollipop in his mouth, which shifted from one side to the other when he spoke. Kevin didn't say nothing about no other girl. Well, that's kind of a last minute thing. I gave him a big smile. And the crew looked at each other and shrugged. The man in the white suit gave me a once over and he rolled his eyes. Fine, he grunted, and chomped the red lollipop into pieces, saliva running down his chin like blood. Go get changed, and uh, you might want to loosen up. If you sign an agreement like she did, anything goes. My friend is just going to help me for a minute. I smiled again and grabbed Deborah's hand to pull her toward the restroom. I ignored the look on her face until we were inside the tiny drywall bathroom with the door closed. We both had started whimpering and shoving each other at once. As usual, it was Deborah who went out, despite her weakened condition. What are you doing here? She hissed. You have no idea what these people are capable of. Why didn't you tell me about all of this sooner? I cried, pointing at a needle mark. You didn't exactly make yourself available. Deborah responded coldly. But don't feel bad, this is what I deserve. But I never wanted you to be a part of it. No, don't say that, don't. I took a deep breath and dialed a number on the phone in my pocket. Look, it'll be alright, I've called the cops. Are you crazy? The cheap wall shook as Deborah pushed me against it. Those guys will break this door down a long time before the cops show up. And when they see that you've called... Something pounded on the bathroom door and we both jumped. It sounded like the butt of a pistol. A gruff voice told us to hurry up. In the area outside, I could hear the man in the white suit telling the others what he wanted them to do to us and how to make the best at camera angle while doing it. I searched desperately for a weapon, but there was nothing. Not even a toothbrush or a towel rack that could be ripped out of the wall. Deborah just held herself, resigned. It was only a matter of time before they unlocked or kicked the door down and dragged us out by force. I hugged Deborah. I didn't know what else to do. I felt her sick, damp, ragged breathing on my neck, and I knew that I should have taken care of her like this from the beginning. Like it or not, what happened to Chantel had bound us together, no matter what. A few minutes later, the conversation stopped, and I wondered if I was really hearing what I thought I was hearing from the abandoned building's outside door. Alright, what the heck is it now? I heard the man in the white suit groan. Get lost, we're busy. The doorbell rang again. There was no way this broken down rat trap had a doorbell, but we heard it, nevertheless, getting louder each time. Xavier, take care of it. The man in the white suit snarled. You got it, boss. Xavier boomed in a deep drawl. I heard the sound of a handgun slide and a peephole sliding open. And then silence. Xavier. The man in the white suit murmured. You okay? What's out there? No response. Xavier. Came an angry order and then a gunshot and a clamor of voices. My God, he's dead. Everybody calm down, I heard the man in the white suit roar. Heavy breathing, weapons being readied. Knocking. No one moved. No one wanted to be the first to face what was out there. Chantel, an 11 year old girl that had been braver than all of them. I heard a meaty, slopping sound like something wet lifting itself off the ground. It's all right, said a friendly voice. It had a deep, booming Louisiana drawl, 
and the air wheezed through a bullet hole in its jaw as it spoke. It's all right. You can let us in. The lights went out. Someone flung open the main door. Screams at gunshots. I blocked the bathroom door with my body and Deborah and I clutched each other tightly in the dark, just as we had seven years ago. The officers who arrived 20 minutes later were a bit uncomfortable, having to batter down the bathroom door, rather than me opening it, but they complied. There was no blood and no signs of violence except for a few stray bullet holes on the wall. Given our history, I knew how our story would sound without evidence to back it up. Fortunately, Deborah was lucid enough, despite the drugs, to give the right amount of detail about what she had been going through. One old officer coiled his mustache disbelievingly as he listened, and when the others moved away, he leaned in close. Use the girls from that disappearance seven years ago, yeah? Yeah, I nodded, a knot forming in my stomach. His mouth twisted. It was the expression of a person too cynical to smile. You know, if I was to give some advice in a strictly non-professional capacity... The officer let his aviator glasses slide down his beaky nose and gave us both a cold, blue-eyed glare. I would say you might want to think about leaving town for good. I couldn't agree more. I smiled, and I squeezed at Deborah's hand. After rehab, Deborah moved to the town where I attend college. At first, I thought that with my scholarship, that I would only be able to afford to live in the dorms, but things had worked out quite differently. When Deborah's father had heard about all that had happened, he was happy to help pay for an apartment where his daughter could get back on her feet. We're roommates now, and although we haven't heard any mysterious knocking lately, we still keep our own rules and our own keys.